Good morning, Hope City. Welcome to our online service. As you watch this service, uh, there are a number of our folk who are gathered together in this, in this very building, worshiping God together, sitting under his word together. It is our privilege to worship God. It is our privilege to be together as his people, and it is our joy to do so. So we are so glad you can join us in this way, and we really look forward to seeing you again in person, hopefully sooner rather than later. In the meantime, we are going to continue in our, our service of worship. We're going to begin with a call to worship, just as we do each Sunday. Would you join us? As we gather together, we come in response to our great God who has loved us first, who the Bible tells us has called us by name. To know him and to be known by him, our response is one of worship and love. Let us respond to this call to worship. Hear these words, Hope City Church. God, our God, how glorious is your name in all the earth. Your glory is sung by all of your creation. When we look to the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, we wonder, who are we that you care for us and for the world? You are the God of life, crowning us with glory and honor to serve you all of our days. O oh God, our God, how glorious is your name in all the earth. Come, let us worship the Lord together this day. of our God and King Lift up your voice and with us sing Hallelujah Hallelujah Thou burning sun with golden beam Thou silver moon with softer gleam Oh praise Him Oh praise Him Let us pray together as we continue in worship. Our Father, we thank you this morning for our great privilege to be called by your name, 
the name that is above all names, for there is none like you. You are the only uncreated one. You are the one to whom everything owes its existence, owes its allegiance, owes its worship and its love. Father, we thank you that we can come and do that, Lord, with a, a clear sense of what we're doing because you have opened our heart's eye to see this great truth, that there is none like you, that we are yours, and that we need you. And so, Lord, as we come to you as your people, we thank you that we come in response to your, your gracious call and your gracious loving act to bring us to yourself in Jesus Christ. We come knowing, Lord, that we do not deserve this, but that you give it freely to all who will come humbly, to all who will repent, to all who will trust in Christ. And so we pray, Lord, that you may find us to be that people this day. And in the very same breath, we pray, Lord, help us to be that people. Father, would you help us to worship you well? And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite you to open up to Exodus chapter 3. We'll be reading the first 15 verses together. Would you read along with me? Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. This is the word of the Lord. So I've got some really good news for you this morning. Uh, in fact, it's great news for each and every one of you listening. Possibly the best news I could ever hope to give you. Okay, this is it. God does not need you. Okay, let me say that again. God does not need you, and this is very good news for you. Now, I hope I'm going to explain or at least help you understand why I say that in a way that you'd agree with me at the end of the sermon, but I do want to show you this is no gimmick. Okay, I'm not playing a little game here, a little trick to try and grab your attention up front. I really mean this very sincerely. Have you ever watched Mary Poppins, the movie, the, the old one, the first one? There's a scene at the end where Mr. Banks is summoned to a late night meeting at the bank. He's got to see the board. Things have not gone well, and things don't end well for Mr. Banks. 
he, um, he gets humiliated, he, gets, he loses his job, they, they punch a hole through that round black hat that they used to wear back then, they turn his umbrella inside out. And at the end of that little sequence in that scene, he starts to giggle, he starts to laugh uncontrollably in response to the question of the head of the board and he says, Banks, what do you have to say for yourself? And he, he takes out these two little coins, the, the tuppence, and if you watch the movie, you'll know exactly what that's about. And a word comes to his mind, it's the word that Mary Poppins had uh, taught his children and which he had subsequently learned. The word is this, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. And he starts laughing uncontrollably and he walks out of that place rejoicing and the words of the board are, the man's gone mad. And then the scene plays out and off, off he, he goes and he arrives at home and he takes his children out and, and the movie ends with them flying a kite together and just enjoying life together. Unbeknownst to the board, but very, very clear to Mr. Banks and his family is that a change has occurred. And the change has occurred because Mr. Banks in that moment has, had a, has a moment of, of profound clarity, seeing things in a true sense, in a way he'd never seen before. Now when I say my statement is no gimmick, I'm being absolutely sincere when I say that no matter what you are facing in your life right now, no matter what it is, however wonderful or however painful or however terrifying this thing might be, coming to the realization that God does not need you will bring more comfort and security to your soul than you might ever believe is possible. And possibly more than anything else I could say to you this morning. It's a moment of clarity that can change everything. God does not need you. God does not need me. Our text this morning is a clarifying text. And the subject of clarification is God himself. Moses needed clarification, okay? The Israelite who grew up in Egypt 40 years of his life. Some things happened there and he had to flee the country. He ends up in, in the wilderness for 40 years. He marries into a Midianite family. His father-in-law, we are told in verse one, was the priest of Midian. In other words, they weren't even serving this God that he's encountering now in this burning bush experience. Moses needed clarification. The Israelites themselves needed clarification. The promise of Abraham was theirs, but they'd been in Egypt for 400 years now. They had not heard a word from the God who had made that promise. We need clarification this day. In our culture, in our time, the, the idea of God is very nebulous. It means many things. I mean, what do we even mean when we say the word G-O-D, God? There's a sense in our culture that when we say God, we, we kind of all know what we're talking about. We think we're talking about the same thing. You know, there's a supernatural being out there, but it's such a nebulous concept that it actually in reality seems to have no meaning because the minute you go past, just, just slightly past that sort of single point we all maybe agree on when we're talking about God, we realize that no one's actually on the same page. Is he, is he the creator God? Is that the God we're talking about? Is he even a he? Is he a she? Is an it? You know, is this God actually perfectly good? What, who is this God? We need clarification. And then our definition of being religious or spiritual or even Christian sometimes is often reduced to this basic idea. Do you believe in God? Yes, I believe in God. But then we go back to the previous question and again, it becomes very confusing because suddenly even religion or the idea of spirituality can become very nebulous possibly almost meaningless. What do you say, what do you mean when you say that you're religious or that you are spiritual? Well, that's gonna be defined by what you mean when you say God, G-O-D, isn't it? Now, when you read the Bible, and quite specifically the narrative we have before us today, here in Exodus chapter three, you'll discover very quickly that it's very important to God that he tells us with clarity exactly who he is and who or what he isn't. God takes this very seriously. Now he doesn't do it all at once, okay? He doesn't create the equivalent of an Old Testament or ancient Wikipedia page and write down this comprehensive technical document all, with all the specs and all the details and all the info for us to go and peruse. He works a little bit differently, more like a blossom that unfolds into a flower over a period of time. 
there's the rose, and as it opens its petals little by little over that period of time, we begin to see that rose with more clarity, and we're e increasingly able to appreciate its beauty, its true beauty. It was always the rose, we're just beginning to see it more clearly as those petals unfold. And so through the unified and unfolding narrative of Scripture, we see God doing this. Through his direct interactions with specific people like Abraham or like Moses, as we have in the, the passage before us, and through the story that unfolds around all that in his dealings and in his actions. We have this in the pages of Scripture, this beautiful flower of the glory of God being revealed, his purposes in the world being revealed for all to see. And as we discover this God in the pages of Scripture, we discover very quickly the other side of the same coin, how important it is that we conceive of him clearly, rightly, with clarity, in truth, that we understand him rightly and that we respond appropriately, accordingly. Very important. When we say we are Christian, we are saying that our personal and communal identity as the church is defined by a specific and particular, particular revelation of the divine being, of God himself. Not just a particular set of moral ideals or the kind of worship gathering you might expect when you come to church. These are secondary, third level, however many level elements that are connected to the central element. And the central element around which the whole wheel turns is who God is. Who is this God? The text before us is a critical, clarifying text in Scripture for all who would want to know and follow the God of the Bible. And as we look at it this morning, we're going to look at it under two points. And these two points, I think as we, s as we look at the passage, um, are, 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 are based on the two vital things that the passage communicates to us about God. Let me give them to you quickly. Number one, God is transcendent. Okay? And number two, God is imminent. God's transcendence and his imminence. Now, if those two theological words are just a little bit intimidating right now, don't worry. I hope they'll make much more sense in just a little bit. But for the sake of having two points that are a little bit easier to latch onto this morning, I'm going to reach out for some help from, uh, I wish I could say some friends of mine, but from um, some guys you might know. They're the band U2. I hope like Mary Poppins, my, um, my, my illustrations and examples aren't dating me too much and are something you at least know something about. U2 should be safe. Eh? Everyone, everyone knows a bit about U2, I think. Okay, let's just go with it. They sing a song, and the song's title is this, With or Without You, With or Without You. You guys all know that song. I, I hope you do. Well, we're not going to do much else with the song right now. We're just going to borrow the words from the title um, to give us maybe something a little bit more tangible to hang our, our ideas on this morning. Point one, we're going to talk about God without you. Okay, God without you. This is his transcendence. And point two, we're going to talk about God with you, his eminence. God without you and God with you. Let's start with that first one, God without you, his transcendence. When we speak of the transcendence of God, we are talking about the idea that God is above and beyond anything that exists. And I mean absolutely anything here. And I'm not just talking like there's a scale, okay, from zero to a hundred or whatever the scale might be. And down at the bottom you at zero, you've got rocks and sort of inanimate things, dirt, whatever. And then maybe just above that on the scale, you've got bugs and then maybe slightly more complex animals and eventually people, human beings, and then maybe above that, angels or some kind of supernatural being. And then above that, as sort of the, the apex or, or the, the, the premier being, the supreme being on the scale, we have God. Okay? Like we're all beings with increasing levels of consciousness or self-awareness. And then there's something at the top, the supreme being as the epitome um, 
of, of all the best characteristics of the rest of us or, or whatever we might imagine what you'd have to be to be at the top of this scale. Now, when the Bible brings across this idea of the transcendence of God, the idea is this. Very simply, God is not on this scale. Okay, we're on the scale. Everything else is on the scale, but God is not on the scale. God is off the scale. You have God, and then you have everything else that is. The uncreated, self-existing, self-sufficient creator, you've got him, and then the created, creation, everything else. There's obviously a lot going on in the passage, but there are two main points in the dialogue that we're going to focus on this morning. And in fact, we'll be looking at the same verse for, for both sections of, of the sermon this morning, uh, the, the God without us, the transcendence of God, and God with us, the immanence of God. And the, the two parts I want to focus on are, are the sections where Moses asks his questions of God. There are two questions that Moses asks. Moses has seen the strange sight of a burning bush, but the bush is not consumed by the fire, we're told. He's heard the voice of the Lord. He's come close. He's realized that God is speaking to him. Some of the parameters of the exchange have been established because he's been told to take off his sandals, his shoes, because he's on holy ground. And Moses has hidden his face because he's afraid to look at God. And God has told him that he has heard the cries of his people, the Israelites, who have been enslaved in Egypt, and that he's now going to deliver them from their captivity. He's going to deliver them from the wicked Pharaoh who rules over them. And he's commissioning Moses to go and be the leader of this little operation under God. So let's read verses 10 and 11 and 12 together again. God says, So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Verse 12, and God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And in the second question, let's have a look at that too quickly. Verses 13 to 15, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Question one, Moses asks, who am I that I should be able to do this task that you've given me? Pharaoh's not going to listen to me. I've got no power, no standing, no authority. What is God's answer? Moses, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who Pharaoh is. I will be with you. It matters who I am. Moses, I don't actually need you. This is about me. Question two, well, who are you? What should I tell the Israelites? What is your name? Answer to you, I am who I am. Or the Hebrew can probably be more directly translated as I will be who I will be. Tell them that I am has sent me to you. The Hebrew for I am is this little, this little word, echyeh. And in the next verse, he says, tell them, Yahweh, he is, has sent me to you. I am, he is, Yahweh, has sent me to you. And God in this moment reveals to Moses his divine name, not a title, not a description of an aspect of his character, but this name that encapsulates his essential being. He is, he is. He is the one who is and will be. And in the communicating of his divine name, God makes it clear that his existence doesn't depend on anyone or anything else. This God simply is self-existent, self-sufficient, 
in himself. And every night I spend time with our children, uh, we read together before they go to sleep. We normally start with a, a story, um, often a, a chapter book we're reading through, and then, and then we read the Bible together, and then we pray together. And if everything has gone according to plan, at the end of that little series of events, sequence of events, Daddy and Mommy get to sign off for the day. Now, if you're a parent, you'll know exactly how important that moment of the day is. But it's very seldom that it's ever just a story and then the Bible and then, you know, we pray and we kiss goodnight and that's that. Because children have questions. And this is prime time for question asking when you are an inquisitive child. But as a parent, and I hope I'm not the only one in this room or, or if you're watching online uh, in your room, if you're a parent who experiences this reality, my motivation levels for answering those questions at this particular time of the day are not super high when I can see the finish line right in front of me. And this is a little bit complicated because the, chil- the questions that children ask are not simple questions, okay? They're not simple questions with simple, satisfying answers. And the two big is, the two big questions, which as a parent, if you're if it's your turn with the kids this night, you're praying tonight isn't going to be this night that they're going to ask probably one of these two questions. Number one, daddy or mommy, where do babies come from? Okay, biggie number one. And the other one, daddy, mommy, where does God come from? Well, question number one, the answer is actually quite similar. I do know the answer to the question, but seven-year-old James, I'm just not sure he's ready for that answer yet. So I'm... I'm avoiding that one right now, okay? Question two, well, here again, if the Bible as our source is going to be read and understood correctly, the answer is, again, actually pretty simple. The problem is we just don't understand it properly. We can't understand it properly because the answer, where does God come from, is, well, he doesn't come from anywhere or anything. He just is. I am. He is. There's a simple unity to the God of the Bible that is beyond any reference point we have in our world to make sense of it. Does that mean it can't be true? That it's implausible? I don't think so. I think it just means we don't have a reference point in our world to try and make that leap of understanding to truly understanding what that is all about. You see, we learn by using what already exists and what we already know as a bridge over which we pass to the things we don't know. I mean, that's true in pretty much everything. And even in our wildest science fiction movies, in creating the most out there characters or aliens that we are able to imagine, we use bits and pieces of the ordinary stuff of our world as the starting point to conceptualize this something new. You know, if we look carefully, we can always identify their prototypes because they are drawing from something we already know. That's the definition of a creature, of something created. It has origin. But the great I am, we are told, and Moses is told here, has no origin. He is the original source for everything else that is. Everything else that is, is because he is. That's the logic Yeah. And if nothing else was, or ever were to be, he still is. Now, I totally get it that there may be a number of people viewing this online or sitting in our church congregation this morning who would be very skeptical of this notion, this idea that we can make a statement about God which is essentially totally untestable. Isn't that right? I mean, how do we prove this? How do we test that hypothesis? Now, I acknowledge that, and unfortunately, I can't, I can't knock that that. Um, come back down but I think it is probably reasonable to say that no matter who you are and no matter what your framework for understanding life is everybody every philosophy has to arrive at this very point that point of the question beyond the question beyond the question which is what is there what is that point of ultimate origin ultimate cause At the end of the day, no matter where you're coming from this morning, I think it is pretty fair to say 
however skeptical you may be of believing that this God is that ultimate, that ultimate origin, that, that ultimate cause, each one of us is, is really at the same place at the end of the day, no matter where you're coming from. Uh, each one of us is coming to a place where we have an assumption based on faith regarding what that starting point is, and then we have all the reasoning based on what we can know and see as validation for the reason we hold to the position we do regarding what that ultimate starting point is. Now whether you're clearly articulating that and have very definite thoughts about that, or whether you're just saying, I don't know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm agnostic about that, is an element that of truth in, in, in the idea that each one of us is, is starting from a place of faith there. Okay, there's nothing that we can just see and touch that says, yes, this is that answer. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be trying to explain this to you. There'd be no discussion. If one of us could point and say, yeah, boom, there it is. One more big mental move. I hope you're hanging in there. It's the last heavy sort of space we'll be in, I promise you. And that is this. God's isness, okay, his isness, his I amness, his divine being is complete and lacking in nothing. In other words, he's not just self-existent, he's also self-sufficient. In other words, God didn't create anything because he needed it, or in our case, he didn't create us because he needed us. There was no sense of loneliness or emptiness or incompleteness in God that prompted him to create something. He is. And theologians speak of God's divine unity. What this means is that God is simple, He's uncomplex in a way that we aren't as people. Let me give you a quick example of this. I've been married for over 14 years now. I can guarantee you, and I'm sure my wife will agree with me, that I'm not the man my wife married 14 years ago. I mean, I'm the same, but I'm also not the same. I've changed physically, my character, you know, whatever. I'm, I've, I've changed. I've become something else. Physically, I'm probably a little bit softer, Okay, then I was, I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge that. Hopefully in character, the same can be said of me, a little bit softer. But I change, you change. I'm called a human being. But it may be more accurate to describe me as a human becoming. I'm the sum of my parts. I may be patient or gentle most of the time, but not all of the time. Just as on the negative side, I might be a bit of a procrastinator more of the time in a get it done now so I don't have to do it later kind of guy less of the time. But I exist as this balance of good and not so good traits that I'm trying to refine as I go along through life. I'm the sum of my parts and I have many different needs and they, these needs play out in varying intensities based on what the sum of my parts is, what, what my weaknesses and strengths are. But God is not like that. As the great I am, He is self-existent within himself. Now, A.W. Tozer, who was a Christian pastor and author in, his, in, the, in the early and mid-1900s, expressed it really beautifully in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, when he wrote these words. The doctrine of the divine unity means not only that there is but one God, it means also that God is simple and complex, one with himself. The harmony of his being is a result not of a perfect balance of parts, but the absence of parts. Between his attributes, no contradiction can exist. He need not suspend one to exercise another. For in him, in him sorry, all his attributes are one. All of God does all that God does. He does not divide himself to perform a work, but works in the total unity of his being. God is love, God is peace, God is joy, God is holiness, God is beauty. I could go on and on. Not as bits and pieces, when you put them all together, they, they make the whole. They're one. They are the whole, without conflict, without tension. God the I am, never changing, never growing in love, because he is already. The supreme being, never becoming, unlike us, the always becoming. 
He is Yahweh, self-existent, self-sufficient, always. But let's get back to Moses. And so Moses, as you read the verses, who are you? You're feeling insufficient for the commission I've given you to go to Pharaoh and lead my people out of captivity. Moses, I don't need you for this. I am. The truth is, you need me. Let me apply this to something a little closer to home. Lockdown, COVID-19, the year 2020. Church. Why, Why do we do this thing called church? Why do we come together to worship God week in and week out? I'm pretty sure that a lot of people are re-evaluating that question for themselves at this moment. I'm pretty sure they're re-evaluating a whole lot of things about their lives right now. In fact, when you look at some of the research being released by groups like Barna, which is a leading research organization focusing on this intersection of faith and culture, it's very clear that many Christians are re-evaluating that question for themselves. The opening headline of the main article on the front page of their website at the moment reads this, one in three practicing Christians has stopped attending church during COVID-19. Okay, one in three practicing Christians has stopped attending church during COVID-19. Now as churches start to open their doors again, time will tell what the real implication of that observation is. But the question is, why? Why is this happening? Why is this the response of people as they are re-evaluating church, their involvement in a worshiping community? As I think back through the shifts in church culture that I have seen throughout my own life, it, it could read something like this maybe. Point A or or moment A or period A as it played out, we needed to make church more relevant, so we turned it into a rock concert slash TED talk, okay? We needed people to want to engage, to want to come, to feel like they were getting something that was meaningful for their lives in this moment, so we we gave them that. Relevance was a a big word in the way we thought about how we do church for a long time. Maybe a second point is upon us, I don't know. You know, maybe it would read something like this eventually. You know, we needed to make church maybe not relevant. Maybe that wasn't the cry anymore. Maybe it was convenient. Now, I realize there are mitigating circumstances. We were in a hard lockdown. I realized that we didn't have an option at some point. But maybe as this plays out, we will see that this is something that is more true than we may have realized. Maybe we needed to make church more convenient. So we turned it into an optional Zoom call. You know, we don't exactly have the greatest record of people being at church every Sunday anyway before lockdown happened. I mean, here in Cape Town, we've regarded, you know, if you're here two out of four, sun, two out of four Sundays in a month, we, we, we count you as a regular. We think you are committed. You know, that's kind of the culture at the moment. People have a lot going on in their lives. And, and church is kind of one part, and two out of four is, is pretty, pretty high up there for a lot of people. I'm not saying anything about that just yet, but just let that idea simmer down. Oh, well, simmer, (laughs) let it simmer for a bit. What if in making those two statements and in sort of like rejigging church to kind of meet people where they're at in these ways, we actually inadvertently do something else? What if we end up, what if we have ended up doing this maybe? We needed to make God more relevant. So we turned him into a rock concert slash TED talk. Or depending on how this next one plays out over time, maybe we needed to make God more convenient. So we turned him into an optional Zoom call. All the while, subtly eroding away in our hearts and minds that fundamental anger point that God alone is the great I am. Needing nothing, needing no one. At the same time, subtly eroding away the corresponding converse point 
of truth that if he is the great I am and the true source of all that is, then there is nothing that I need more than him. And we've just eroded it away by making God relevant, by making him convenient. You see, the truth is we need the great I am. I need the great I am as my God, as my center point, as my life. When you look at the Bible, relevance, convenience, some non-issues. Because remember, if Exodus 3 and the rest of the Bible is true, we come together to worship God, not because God needs us, not because God needs our worship, not because our worship completes or fulfills Him in any way. Yes, he's worthy of our worship. Yes, we owe him our worship. Yes, we must worship him. But we gather together to worship and to sit under his word together for the exact opposite reason. God does not need us. We need him. God does not need us. We need him. So why aren't we here? Let me give you the good news of Exodus 3 and the entire Bible. God is transcendent and He is imminent. He is Yahweh without us. He doesn't need us, but He chooses to be Yahweh with us. He wants us. Let's think about our YouTube song one last time. Very catchy, but tragic because the main character in the song is caught in this terrible conundrum. Can't live with or without the one he loves. If he has her, he's miserable. If he can't have her, he's miserable. It's lose-lose for this poor chap. He has this gaping hole within himself that he needs this other person to fill to the extent that he can't even conceive of himself without her. Either way, he's defined by her to his detriment because she can never actually be what he needs in his life. Listen to A.W. Tozier again. He writes, God, on the other hand, has a purely voluntary relation to everything he has made, but he has no necessary relation to anything outside of himself. Let me say that again. God, on the end, has a purely voluntary relation to everything he has made, but he has no necessary relation to anything outside of himself. His interest in his creatures arises from his sovereign good pleasure, not from any need that those creatures can supply, nor from any completeness they can bring to him who is complete in himself. Think about our passage again. Moses in verse 11 to 13. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Irrelevant Moses, it's not who you are, it's who God is. But this God, the great self-sufficient self-existent, great I am, what does he say to you? He says, I am with you. I go with you. I am for you. Transcendence, imminence, clarity. Israel, who is your God? The great self-existing, self-sufficient I am who has already moved towards you in the promise he has made to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, that he is now acting on to fulfill in your redemption. The great I am who doesn't need you, but wants you, not because of anything you are or anything you have to offer him, but simply of his own choosing, who moves towards you to redeem you. Not because of anything you can bring. He does so so that he may bring you into the full experience of what you were actually created for. Clarity. And to you sitting here today or listening in by this streaming service, the great I am comes to offer himself as Yahweh with you in his greatest self-revelation or burning bush moment the world has ever been shown. Listen to the words of John chapter 8 as Jesus responds to the Pharisees who are confronting him. In verse 58, he writes, or he says, Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, Before Abraham was born, 
I am. Okay, he's, 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 he's not just making a subtle reference here. It's very clear to those listening what he was meaning when he says the statement. Yahweh with us has come to be with you in me. In New Testament, Jesus takes this I am name to himself and he applies it very intimately to our greatest needs, our greatest areas of brokenness. You can, you can track throughout John chapter 8 and seeing him demonstrating and expressing this over and over again. To those who hunger, he says, I'm the bread of life. To those who thirst, he says, I'm the living water. To those in darkness, Jesus declares, I'm the light. To those who need a fresh start, he says, I'm the door. To those who feel abandoned, I'm the good shepherd. To those who feel lost, Jesus says, I'm the way. To those who are confused, I am the truth. To those who are afraid of death, I am the life. To those who are unrighteous, Jesus says, I will be your righteous covering. To the powerless, he says, I will be your defense. To the empty, he says, I will be your fullness. And to the dead, he says, I will be your resurrection. To the defeated, he says, I will be your hope. Why is it such good news that God doesn't need you? Because in the story of the great I am, he is constantly over and over again moving towards his people in compassion and love. And at that story's climax, we see Jesus, God in the flesh, in the greatest moment of self-revelation and clarity the world has ever seen, doing something remarkable. He doesn't ask us to remove our shoes so that we can come closer. The Son of God has his shoes removed. In fact, has all his garments removed by those who would spit in the face of the great I Am so that he could enter into that holy moment on our behalf once and for all to open the doorway for all who would follow in that holy moment, as our sins are carried before the holy throne of God on his shoulders and judged there, we see the God of holy grace extending forgiveness to us without the slightest question. Unconditional love is ours because God doesn't need us, because God wants us. He's not manipulating us or working us to some end to get something selfish out of this for himself. He sacrifices himself for us. The God who doesn't need us sacrifices himself for us, for our redemption, for our healing, for our greatest need to be met by the one who has no need of anything or anyone, for he is our greatest need. And therein is your peace, your security, your comfort. So let us worship our God and Father in Jesus Christ together. He's more relevant than we could ever know when this moment of clarity happens for us. Relevance is, is bigger than we can ever think. Convenience is a non-issue. We owe our all to Him. He is the Son of around which everything does and should gravitate. He needs to become the son of our lives and by his grace, he makes that possible by becoming Yahweh with us in the fullest way we could, hope, we could ever hope to know his people as he comes in the person of Jesus. Let us pray together as we respond to our God and to his advances of love, though we do not deserve it. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you this day. Lord, we thank you for a story that, that could not be made up by human minds. Father, it, it goes into territory that we would just not go. Lord, as we seek to defend ourselves and affirm ourselves and make ourselves Lord you you tell a story that tells a truth to us that we need to hear this morning again Lord we 
very easily lose sight of the fact that you are who you are and that we are who we are. But we thank you, Lord, for the moments of clarity, for burning bush moments, in a sense, where you, by your Holy Spirit, speak to us, where you help us to see clearly, where you help us to respond appropriately. And so, Lord, as we see you as this God, transcendent, but as we see you as the God who in all he does is constantly moving towards us because he loves us. Lord, we, we find ourselves in a strange place because we know that we have no right to respond, but because of Christ we have a freedom to come as children who run into the arms of a, of a welcoming father with not a hint of question or pushback in his eyes, in his demeanor, in his actions. We are yours. Christ has won us. And so, Father, as we let this deep truth simmer, I pray that you would do the work of making it real in our hearts and minds. But, Lord, we realize that we cannot just worship you from a distance. We come humbly, but we come in submission. We come in surrender because we need you. But, Father, we owe you everything you have a claim on us lord that isn't measured it doesn't weigh up a bit of this and a bit of that to figure out what that claim is it's 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 a total claim but lord we come joyfully realizing that we come to the one who owns us for our good and for our flourishing and for our well-being and so lord we pray that you lead us into the joy of knowing you the joy of following you the joy of surrendering to you, the joy of being obedient to you and serving you above all else in our lives because Christ in his grace and in his death and resurrection has set us free to do so. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to the word of the Lord with a simple prayer of confession. We do this each week as we gather together in our worship services because we know that we cannot just hear and walk away. We need to respond. We need to respond in repentance and in faith. We need to hear the word of assurance of God's love to us, His grace to us in Jesus Christ. So let's do that again this morning. Let's pray this prayer together. O oh Lord, we want to enter your presence, awed by your majesty, greatness, and glory, yet encouraged by your love. Yet there is a coldness in our hearts, a hardness towards you, an unwillingness to admit sin and our need for you. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. Come near and strengthen us until Christ reigns supreme within us. In every thought, word, and deed, Give us faith that purifies the heart, overcomes the world, works by love, fastens us to you, and always clings to the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear this word of assurance, this good news. From Romans chapter 8 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy is more 
stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What patience could wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more Praise the Lord, His mercy is more Stronger than darkness Mercy is more. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more Praise the Lord His mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord his mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins they are many His mercy is more Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Why don't we go with these words of benediction? We've gathered together this Lord's Day to glorify God, to enjoy His goodness to us. As you leave this place, realize that we exist to glorify and enjoy Him in all places and at all times. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God bless.